How is the can BIS as a physical layer setup? The consists of two weeders whose ends are closed with a resistance of 120 ohms. Of course, it has better noise immunity, meaning it has good protection from noise. It reduces cost, weight, and wires while increasing reliability. Naturally, the diagram on the left is without the CAN bus, and the one on the right shows how it appears when implemented. The transmission characteristics can reach megabit per second. Its board rates are either 1025 kilo hertz or 500 kilo hertz or 1 megahertz. Often the baud rate is reading kilo, so you might find the 1 megahertz written in the data sheet as 1000 kilohertz. Of course, all nodes must operate at the same speed. If there's a node not working at the same speed, it will receive errors. Let's take an example. I have the instrument panel ACU. What does that mean? It means that this is the ACU for the meter. Let's say, can anyone tell me what the block temperature is? What does this mean? There is a type of frames called the remote frame. What does the remote frame mean? For instance, I have CU2, which is for temperature, and there's a CU1, which is for the instrument panel related to the meter. The SCU2 for temperature should send an IG for 100. Who filters this ID? ECU1. It has a filter that if it receives 400, it accepts it. When it gets the 400, it looks at the data, which is the temperature data. Now the instrument panel ECU has sent a remote frame saying, can anyone tell me? So it's like sending a remote frame with um, ED400. What does it mean? In the remote frame sends with the eye it wants to receive. So when any node on the CAN BIOS receives a remote frame, it's supposed to send to it. I sent a remote frame with ID 400, meaning anyone who should send with ID C 400, please send to me. Again, what does sending a remote frame mean? The remote frame means I'm requesting anyone to send with ID 400. Please send me the data you have. Because I filter, I send a packet remote frame. This remote frame goes to any ECU. Hopefully, in case studies 1A2, once you connect to the filter, you can filter that you receive the remote frame. If you receive the remote frame, it comes in the ESR showing that it's a remote frame. Then you check its ID. You find the IZV400. You know that it's requesting from you. Because you are the ACU program to send with ID400, then you come into this is run configure it to send a packet with ID 400, including the temperature data. Again, every ECU on the bus filters with a range of IDs. So as ACU1, anyone who sends with ID 400, I accept it and respond with I can display the data in the temperature. But no one has sent me anything. So in the software, I send a remote frame, not a data frame. The remote frame means I'm requesting. Guys, whoever sends with IG400, I send with ID400 in the remote frame. It's like telling them, anyone who sends with ID400 on the bus, please send to me. So ACU2, which is for temperature, sent with ID400 uh, to ACU1 and will now send a data frame. I use the remote frame to request from someone and I identify them by the ID they send me while the data frame is a response they send to me. The temperature ECU sent a data frame with ID 400. When you received it, you accepted it and processed it. As written in the text, the block ECU saw this message and will send the message with IG 400 and data equals 076. If you notice in the picture next to the remote frame, there is no data because it's just a request sent with the ID only. Let's dive into the intricacies. But before we delve deep, I'd like you to make a cup of espresso, Turkish coffee or mine tea and focus. Because the upcoming case studies are the ultimate vibe. You'll resonate with me a lot if you love embedded systems. If you're not into embedded, you won't vibe with it. 
So now prepare something to seep on and let's sync up. This lecture, in my opinion, is lighter than the rest. Why? Because it's theoretical while the others are all practical. So let's understand this theoretical part to prepare for the upcoming practical ones. Let's take a break and have a drink. All right, what exactly is the CAN controller as an overview? Meaning, what are its features? The first thing is that it's a multi-master protocol. What does that mean? The concept of the master here signifies that it controls the bus. Meaning, any ACU can take control of the bus and send data on it. And of course, this sending is broadcasting, meaning it's shared with all the ECUs. However, some EECUs filter their ranges to accept and others discard. The discarding doesn't return an ACK, while acceptance does send an ACK in response. So, what does multi-master mean? If one is controlling the bus, no one else can take it, unless the ECU currently sending completes its task. The term master implies that the ECU controls the bus to send data and everyone else listen. So, any of them can be a master at any time. Can is event driven, meaning there isn't a specific time range in which you send. Of course, in the software, you can set a specific time range to send. I'm referring to the bus itself, which isn't divided into time slots. The one divided into time slots is called TTCAN, which we'll discuss later. Whereas, classic CAN is event-driven. What does event-driven mean? It means anyone who wants to send can send. CAN is asynchronous, meaning there isn't a clock going between the nodes. However, they all operate at the same bit rate, meaning they're all working, for example, at one kilobit per second. So they all sample at this speed. CAN is a serial communication technology, meaning it's not parallel wires. It's serial, can employs priority-based bitwise arbitration. What's that? It prioritizes the identifiers and based on which has the highest priority, which is the least identifier, that one wins the arbitration. What does arbitration mean? It means that anyone sending on the bus reads what they send. I send on the TX and receive on the RX and I check if what I'm sending on the bus is the same as what I'm receiving. If not, then someone else has taken the bus. So which one of us gets the bus? The um, boost goes to the one with the least, meaning if there's a bit one and bit zero, it'll go to the one who sent bit zero. Thus bit zero means it's the lowest in the identifier and the lowest in the identifier is the one who wins. This implements the CSMATSA concept, which is the collision avoidance part. When two send at the same time, it knows through the arbitration circuit who's the winner on the bus and the other one leaves until the winner finishes using the bus. After that, the one who lost the initial arbitration can return to the bus. It's said that standard can support an 11-bit identifier and also supports a packet carrying an extended identifier, which is a 29-bit field for its ID. Can is differential, not single-ended. What's the difference between them? We'll see shortly, but it's differential and uses two wires and can reach a speed of one mega bit per second. The general characteristics of CAN indicate that it's primarily event. What exactly does the term event driven entail? If we examine this term disregarding the CAM protocol for a moment, it suggests the following. Initially, you have time driven. What does that mean? It means that the bus should have a specific duration for, let's say, ECU one to send and another slot where nobody should transmit. Possibly in the slot after ECU two can send. The system divides the bus so that not everyone can transmit any time. And this is referred to as TATCAM. Everyone on the bus sends within a specific time range. There are also ranges where nothing is transmitted. 
In this manner, the bandwidth utilization is low. What's bandwidth? It refers to how much you're using the bus within one second or a specific period. So if it's time driven, then time is what dictates the transmissions on the bus. But uh, we're not like that. We're event driven. Thus, event driven mean. It means that the bus is available anytime for anyone wanting to send any packet. And of course, the time of message arrival remains unknown. This event driven system can potentially become overloaded because all the ACUs might decide to transmit at a particular moment. At such times, the lowest ID will have the highest priority, allowing it to proceed. For instance, if there's an airbag alert or something similar, it can pass through even amidst all the traffic. What is bus arbitration? This is needed when there are multiple nodes trying to send at the same time. So only one transmitter is allowed to transmit at a time. The nodes with the important messages are the ones that get the bus. From the circuit's perspective, your uh, we told that the message importance is encoded in the message ID. This means the lower value of the identifier is more important. This is because it's treated like the it talk, where the one who first sends a zero wins the bus and he becomes the winner and continues while the loser waits until the winner finishes and then transmits again. As you can see, both the engine controller and the wheel speed sent the start of frame at the same time. Both of them had sent with ID101 and continued similarly, each sending and receiving on the bus they created. Why? Remember, the CAN controller has a digital transmit wire and a digital receive wire. Where are they going? They connect to a transceiver. This transceiver converts digital to digital values, either 1 or 0. 1 is FIVEV depending on your power supply. And 0 is zero. It goes into the transceiver, which converts the TX and RX to a differential wire. What is a differential wire? It means twisted differential wire. There are two wires, one named CAN high and the other CAN low. What happens then? When you send a one on the CAN bus, it communicates with the high node with specific analog values. The CAN high and CAN low are not digital. They are ranges of analog values depending on whether you are high speed or low speed. They have specific forms. The CAN high is in a certain way and the CAN low in a certain way to represent the one. We'll see this later. At the same time, the transceiver produced this one in the form of CAN high and CAN low and it read this differential wire and sent it back to RX. The RX saw the one that it had sent, the RX that translated a specific value, the same transceiver that translated the value it placed on the bus is what it returned to the RX. It also represents digit 1. The transceiver converts this form to forms of 1 and 0. So it returned the shape it placed and found that it's a 1. Thus, the RX saw that it sent a 1 and received a 1. So it's the 1 controlling the bus. Until the engine control and the wheel speed reached a certain point, the first placed a zero and the second placed a one. The engine placed the zero and the can high and can low were formed in the manner that placed the zero. At the same time, the transceiver read this and returned that it's a zero. So it's the winner of the bus. Unlike the wheel speed, when the transceiver wrote A1 on the bus, when it converted what it wrote to Rx, it found it not as one, but as zero. So it knew it's the loser. It knew there was someone else going with him at the same time, and he's the one who won the buzz because the other has a higher priority than him. So it will wait until the engine control finishes and gives it the end of frame to send again. This is the scene, guys. So if two messages are simultaneously sent over the CAN bus, the bus takes the logical and which means one zero gives us zero. The identifier with the lowest binary number gets the highest priority. Let's look at node one, node two, node three, and the bus level. They all send the start of frame together and in the end, 
the ED with the smallest value, which is node 3, won the bus. Then it continued to send the identifier, then send the control field, then the CRC and the end of frame. Pay attention again. What is coming out of the CAN controller? TX and RX, which is logical, meaning either 1 or 0. These go to the transceiver. The transceiver displays high and low. Soon, we'll see that high and low divide into two things. When it's high and drops down, it represents the logic zero. And this logic zero is called dominant. The terms dominant and recessive describe how the bus looks as an analog. Now, if I wrote one in TX, this one is called recessive. The hexagonal shape means zero which is the dominant and the shape where the two wheels are completely side by side, horizontally, represents one as a voltage and it's called recessive. I'm looking at the bus level, not the TX, RX level, just like you see in the drawing. Node 2 will continue because it has the dominant shape. The transceiver will produce it as logic zero while node D1 has the recessive. So the transceiver will produce it as logic one. Who wins the bus then? We know that the bus acts as a logical and so the winner is logic zero. Therefore, node two will win. The shape of node two will go into the transceiver and will be returned to the RX of the CAN as it received it as logic zero. The CAN stack, you guys are familiar with Ethernet. Remember in college when you studied networking, the Ethernet had a stack with the application layer and there was encapsulation. We start doing encapsulation encryption and then apply the TCP or UDP protocol. And right at the bottom, you have the data link layer and the physical layer. Ken doesn't have all that. It doesn't do encapsulation or anything like that. Its application directly communicates with the data link layer. The data link layer that can provide is simple. You put the AD, the DLC, and the data, and that's it. Can then goes on to add the KRC, do the bit stuffing, adds the start of frame, the end of frame, checks if the echo was sent or not, and sends all this information as zeros and ones sequentially on the physical layer. So in the end, can targets the data link layer and the physical layer. Of course, there's no ECU security and no login like the Ethernet because there are no layers for encapsulation and no user interface, no user, because you go directly from the application to the CAN high data link and the CAN low physical all the time. The CAN high data link is what gives the frame its shape. And the CAN low physical layer is what sends and checks the arbitration and all this stuff. I send the CAN peripheral and this message went to the mailbox of the CAN transceiver. So it reached both of them. The CAN transceiver of the ACU didn't have software to program the ECU to filter by the ID. So it isn't open nor does it filter by any ID. So it discards it as if it didn't see it. However, the ECU in the middle will receive it and accept it. Let's look at the types of CAN frames. Listen up. Guys, there are four types of CAN messages. The data frame is the one we send data onto a specific ID we want to reach. I have several ECUs and each one filters with a specific range. So in your network, there's certainly one that filters with the range containing the ID that will come. That's the one that will accept and respond with an ACK while the rest will discard. What do the remote frame? ACK, for those who have ED X400 that they send with, please send it to me. It means you, as ECU1, send a remote frame with ID equals 400, as if you're requesting anyone actively sending with ID equals 400 to send to you. The error frame is when you have a problem, and the overload frame is when you reach a point where you keep receiving and your mailbox is completely full and you can't receive anymore.